So welcome or welcome back as the case may be to a uh, convocation of the college for the calendar year 2018. Uh, I'm Tim Lynch, the provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, and I'll be serving as uh, sort of master of ceremonies for this morning's event. Um, and I thought it would be a good opportunity today to uh, uh, apprise you of some initiatives that are important to the university and to the campus and the manner in which we plan to implement some changes associated with the university's academic momentum plan. So if you'll indulge me for just a few moments uh, prior, before I turn the, the microphone over to Dr. Call, I'd like to speak about some of the initiatives that are coming out of the Office of Academic Affairs at both the university and campus level. But before I begin, I wanna say, uh, provide a quick update on uh, faculty hires. Uh, there have been at least, <laughs> this is as of yesterday, two dozen new or replacement lines that were approved by the lines subcommittee and Dr. Call uh, since the start of the academic year. And I believe there are a couple of more forthcoming. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Call is aware of that yet, but I got an email yesterday from the engineering technology department seeking an additional pair of faculty members. And these uh, uh, lines have been uh, equitably distributed across more than 15 academic departments. Um, eight of our searches have completed and our colleagues will be joining us next week. I know some of them are here today already and the other searches are in progress and we hope to have all of these positions filled and the departments appropriately staffed for the next academic year. So I think that's important to recognize and to realize the uh, investment that the administration has made on filling faculty lines. We are committed to having uh, full-time faculty members uh, teach as many of our students as possible. And I think this is a testament that even in a time of some budgetary constraints, that we're committed to investing in our faculty and by extension, investing in our students. Uh, a similar investment is going to be made in our academic momentum plan. And uh, if you'll indulge me, I'll just speak about this for just a few minutes. This uh, calendar year is a critical one for both our campus and for CUNY. Uh, in addition to ongoing preparations for next year's uh, Middle States site visit, which is organized around seven new standards. Uh, Dean Corradetti and his team will speak in just a few moments about our preparations for middle states. Um, we're about a year out from the site visit. And this is a, a, a heavy lift. It's going to take a lot of involvement from folks in various academic and student affairs departments. Um, but this is not our only accrediting body. Several of our programs have regional or discipline specific accreditations. Uh, our engineering technology program through ABET, our business program, uh, our nursing program. Uh, recently, our uh, art and design program was accredited through the National Association of Schools of Art and Design. Our, national, uh, our theater program is accredited through NAST, and we're seeking accreditation for our dance and music programs. And these are important initiatives because they validate the hard work of our faculty, because they represent to uh, students or to alumni or to potential uh, donors, for example, the high quality of our program and what we are producing for, uh, for employers. In addition to our accreditation efforts, which are uh, consistent and ongoing, we have a new initiative. Uh, sometimes uh, it seems like every time I answer an email from CUNY, there's a new initiative that we have to respond to, and getting a little bit of initiative fatigue. Uh, so I feel your pain when, when, um, when, you, when you speak about these uh, concerns as well. But this is an important one, academic momentum. It's a university-wide initiative that's aligned with our own work here on campus. Um, there are three components to it, and I'll speak about these in turn. Credit accumulation, I think that speaks for itself, right? You wanna have students who are progressing through the pipeline at an appropriate pace so that they don't spend overlong in college, don't accumulate too much student debt, and are able to enter the workforce as quickly as possible. 
degree maps, which are clear and applied consistently by advisors or others who are working with students, and then efforts to get students through gateway courses, which would be foundational level courses in English and math within their first year. And the way we measure our success is through graduation rates, retention rates, um, and velocity, right? the speed at which students are progressing. This matters because, <coughs> excuse me, these metrics are important because they matter to a lot of stakeholders and constituents. Matters to our students. Uh, how long are they spending in, 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 in college? Uh, it, notice, it matters to parents. It matters to CUNY, which has a scorecard and uh, grades us on our performance relative to these metrics. The federal government, of course, has a vested interest based on uh, default rates or uh, student loan rates upon graduation. And it really matters to us locally because of enrollment management. I've been fielding um, a lot of emails from department chairs. Actually, I've been avoiding them <laughs> and forwarding them to Dean Palmer for, for uh, her to address concerning uh, enrollment con issues. Um, but actually, we're in a very unique situation. Our first time freshmen and our new students are up, in some cases, by a considerable margin, 11% in uh, new students. It's our continuing students that we're having some issues with, uh, getting these students to come back uh, semester after semester. So retention is an important part of enrollment management. It's not just recruitment. And the way students are retained is largely a function of faculty engagement. Are we offering the courses in a particular sequence that students need to succeed? Um, so these are important conversations that we need to have. And of course, student success is a fundamental feature of our strategic plan. Real quickly about uh, retention. Uh, the retention rate for our first time full-time freshmen from the last cohort is about 79%, approaching 80%, which is pretty darn good. Uh, overall, our retention rate for all of our students is less than 70%. So clearly, the outreach and the initiatives and the efforts that we are making towards our first time full-time freshmen are, we think, having uh, a, a, an effect, a positive effect, and we'll be scaling these up perhaps across uh, our student populations. So credit accumulation. This is going to take a campus-wide uh, effort. Full-time enrollment is not on-time enrollment. On-time enrollment is 30 credits a year. Full-time for many, many years had been equated with 12 credits. This is what you required for f uh, federal financial aid, for example. But if you were to um, just do simple math, right, 12 credits a semester gets you 48 in two years, which comes up 12 credits shy of your degree. And there was an anecdote that was shared at an academic momentum meeting last week that a group of us attended at Lehman College. And the facilitator asked a group of students at a campus, how many of you are registered for 12 credits? And 80% of the hands went up. And how many of you expect to graduate in four years? This is a baccalaureate institution. And all of their hands remained in the air. And he said, that's just not going to happen based on credit accumulation. If you want to graduate in four years, you need to take more than the quote unquote minimum that's required for financial aid. You need to take 15 credits at least. So there's going to be a concerted effort by marketing and communications, by advising, by academic affairs, by every office on campus to emphasize the need for students to take more credits. They should be enrolled in 15 per semester, or perhaps it's a bit more uh, palatable to argue 30 per academic year with adroit use of uh, January winter intercessions, summer uh, scheduling as well. So students who take 30 credits in their first year are more likely to graduate. I mean, we have the statistics to show this. This is a, supplied by Complete College America, which is a partner with CUNY in this Momentum campaign. The more credits you take in the first year, the more likely you are to graduate. And we can even disaggregate this. The more credits that you attempt in your first year, 
is an important metric. You don't even have to be successful. You just have to condition yourself to take more credits, to expect more of yourself as a student, and you are making uh, an investment. You have a, some, some skin in the game, as it were. So how can we get students to complete 30 credits a year? Well, we need to uh, change the mindset, right? the new normal, that 30 per year or 15 per term is what is expected of a college student. And I know that there's resistance amongst faculty members. If I were a faculty member in the seat right now, I'd say, this might work at a four-year institution. It's not going to work at a community college where 60% of our students need remediation upon entrance, where many of our students have obligations to employers or child care or elder care issues, but the data doesn't support those reservations. The data shows at every level, community college, baccalaureate institutions, you name it, students do better, not as good as, but better than their counterparts who take fewer credits. So if you attempt more, you will pass more. If you pass more, you'll graduate more quickly. Okay? So we also need to remind students, I think, that they can take the same credit load, 12 or 15, at no additional cost. So why wouldn't you try more? If you take more credits in a particular semester, you can graduate earlier. You don't have to pay the tuition for the additional units. However, if you stayed additional semesters, that you'd have to pay for. You pay by the semester, not by necessarily the credits. So we can emphasize the financial impact that delayed graduation has on students. And I think this might resonate with uh, cost-conscious students or their parents very much. So how do we help students get from uh, taking 12 credits to taking 15? We're going to be working through advisement. Okay? There is a closer coordination, I hope, between OAA and student affairs uh, around the issues of enrollment management as we move forward. Uh, the Office of New Student Engagement, really before students are matriculated, they're getting information about the importance of taking credit-bearing courses as early as possible, taking as many units as they can reasonably fit into their schedule and into their, uh, into their lives. Uh, we'll be working on a marketing strategy, 15 to finish. Uh, take 15 credits every semester or think 30. Uh, I think the 30 credits per academic year is a more palatable message. 15 credits in 15 weeks can be intimidating. 30 credits in 52 weeks doesn't sound as daunting. So I would, you know, if, if I would recommend that we push this 30 per year. And the way we do this is through the intentional use of our winter and summer sessions. We uh, maximize the use of milestone scholarships to get students to over that 30 credit threshold. We use strategically our STEM waiver scholarships so that we can um, assist students as they're progressing through the pipeline. Uh, we lead the university system in the use of e-permits, allowing individuals to take courses that perhaps they can't get at Queensboro someplace else at no additional charge. We have um, a whole series of articulation and dual joint programs, 10 now, with uh, senior colleges. We have a reverse transfer initiative. All of these show a connection to our university partners, both within CUNY and beyond, that uh, allow for uh, a logical progression through the curriculum for our students. Okay. Just to answer some of the questions that I'm sure you have in your mind, we've, we've done a lot of studies, CUNY has. Students who take 15 credits versus 12. Now, admittedly, they're not lighting the world on fire, 2.24 GPA when you take 15 credits, but that's better by a percentage, a couple of, 10%, 10 percent. I'm looking at my mathematician here. 20 percent? 0.1. <laughs> that's the easy way to say it, yeah. So they're doing better if they take more credits. If you take more credits, they do better. They have a higher probability of re-enrolling. So when you're talking about retention rates, persistent rates, they have a higher probability of graduating on time. So this is what we need to emphasize. 
Will our students suffer academically if we push them to take more credits each term? No. So this is, this, these is done by high school GPA. There is really no appreciable negative impact on students taking, there is no appreciable negative impact on students taking more credits. In fact, the opposite is the case. So we should be encouraging our students to take more units from as early a, po a, a time as possible. Another initiative within academic momentum is gateway course completion. Get students through their foundational level developmental education courses in English and mathematics as, as soon as possible. We have a lot of initiatives to address this. The first is alternatives to algebra. Not every student needs to take uh, Math 119, which is college algebra. That's being reserved mostly for students in the STEM programs. Okay? If they're not in the STEM program, they should be taking Math 321, Quantitative Reasoning for Contemporary Society. Um, at the risk of alienating some of my math, math, math friends, uh, there's an argument that the only reason one needs to take college algebra is as a prerequisite to trigonometry. And if you're not going to take trig, you don't need college algebra. So if you're not going to be in a degree path that needs trig, take 321, Quantitative Reasoning in Contemporary Society. The big initiative that we're getting behind here is reform of remediation. We don't want students spending an entire semester taking a no credit remedial course only to then the next term have to register in a three credit or four credit English or math class. Okay? That is delaying graduation, it's slowing progress, it is uh, putting a damper on velocity. What we'd like to do is have students take remedial coursework at the same time that they're taking credit bearing courses, co-requisite co models. This is done with great effect across the university. We're scaling up our efforts here in both English and math through what's called the ALP model, Accelerated Learning Program, and uh, we hope to really um, move, this, move the dial on this, on this initiative uh, this coming academic year. Degree maps and scheduling. We're proposing block scheduling for students in some majors as a pilot in the fall. We're looking at um, you know, utilizing our degree maps and technology to, uh, and I'll speak about degree maps in just a few moments. We're looking at all of these different options that we have for students to become um, eligible for placement in credit bearing courses. CUNY START, Math START, USIP. This afternoon I'll be at CUNY Central discussing uh, proposed changes to the ACCUPLACER exam uh, for students who are coming out of high school to see whether or not they can be placed directly into credit bearing courses from early in their academic year here at college. We're gonna have cleaner and more consistent advising. We have all sorts of um, activities planned around testing and we're gonna have closer collaboration between the academic departments and what's happening in advising. Uh, I've mentioned to the department chairs that perhaps they can designate somebody within their academic departments who would serve as a liaison to enrollment management initiatives to make sure that we're offering courses in the, in the sequence that they are uh, most logically offered to make sure that the information is being uh, disseminated in a timely fashion between enrollment management and the academic departments so that we can offer the courses that are most in demand and the most needed. So. Even if you take 30 credits a year, your completion rates are assisted only if you take the right 30 credits in an academic year. So you wanna get these foundational courses out of the way. Freshman composition, gateway math, whether it's 119 or 321, should be completed as early as possible because there's a lot of uh, courses for which these cl particular classes will serve as prerequisites. So you need to have them uh, completed as quickly as possible so it doesn't slow progress at upper level courses. Degree maps. We have degree maps thanks to the hard work of uh, uh, Karen Steele for all 36 of our programs and it was brought to my attention yesterday. We have degree maps for all, what, 65, is it, Artie? 64 of our subplans. So the degree maps exist already. Um, they're used by advisors, they're used by uh, uh, students themselves in an effort to plan a logical sequence of courses. 
And I'll be working with the departments to make sure that the courses are offered in a logical sequence. You can have a degree map, but it's not useful if there's bottlenecks, if there's uh, illogical sequencing of courses, if there's places where students get stuck. Uh, we want to know where those are, and we can assist by providing additional resources. Advancements in scheduling and registration, I've already spoken about perhaps block registration for students in some degree paths. We have a meeting next week about that very issue. And then closer coordination between academics, departments, advising, and, and the registrar, as we'll be looking at ways to optimize our utilization of classrooms and of times within uh, the instructional day or the instructional week. Here's a typical degree map that helps students and advisors select the right courses to take each semester. Structured and block schedules. Like for example, if you know that your student, if there's a student who's deficient, right, in both math and reading, and they need ALP in both of these uh, situations, you can schedule those courses together in sequence so that students are part of a cohort in these classes and we can uh, track their progress in the system as need be. Okay. So uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, um, but our agenda is full, so I'm going to dodge those. Uh, no, no, if you have questions or comments or concerns, please feel free to address them to me or to any member of the Academic Momentum team. There were eight of us that were in Lehman College last week, myself, Dean Bruno, Vice President Hodge, Vice President DiDio, Dean Palmer, Dean Corradetti, Director Payak, and Director Aileen. Uh, so we've got representation from a broad constituency across campus and are happy to share our findings and our reports with you. I'll be presenting this to the department chairs at our first meeting in February, an update on where we stand with academic momentum, and hopefully that will be disseminated through the departments. But if you have ideas or concerns, please uh, feel free to address them to myself or any member of the team that I just mentioned. Uh, but this is an important initiative, and it's one that I think that um, the university is behind. They've given quite a bit of resources to this, uh, this plan, the academic momentum plan including funding for uh, developmental education reform. Uh, so this is something that um, we, we will be pursuing in the next academic year. <clears throat> All right, um, with that, I'd like to turn the podium over to Dr. Call for some remarks, and then we'll continue with our program. Thanks for your time. Dr. Lynch, and good morning. I hope all of you enjoyed some, or at least part of your break. And it's really very wonderful to be with you this morning to launch the spring term. Just seems as though it were yesterday that we ended our, our fall term, uh, and of course, more recently, our winter session. And I want to give a special thank you to the HEO staff, many of whom are still out there in offices enrolling students. Uh, this has been their busy season, clearly, and I thank them because they really work very hard in, in concert, obviously, with faculty to ensure that we have great enrollment. Uh, I am at heart an optimist, some days an intentional one, uh, but I would like to share a little bit of good news with you, which I think is, is wonderful. The first piece of good news is you met him, Dr. Tim Lynch, and his appointment as Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Uh, he arrived in April. And he very quickly, I think, uh, fit right into our community and has made an enormous difference in many areas to create a positive environment uh, for all of us, faculty, staff, and especially our students. So with uh, enrollment, as you heard, we are still enrolling. We will be continuing that. There are still new freshmen coming in. As Dr. Lynch said, we were pleased at an increase in freshman applications of 11.7%. We're up from this time last year. That's very positive. This is a highly competitive environment these days. And I think it's to a tribute, again, to the, the reputation of Queensboro, the quality of our programs, the excellence and, and extraordinary talent of our faculty. So thank you for that, uh, because it will, it will help us I think going forward. We hope to enroll approximately 15,000, 15 and a half thousand students. 
uh, we, that includes about 2,000 high school students who may take classes on their campuses or on our campus. Speaking of high school students, do you remember BTEC? BTEC was the partnership with Queensboro, the, Department, the New York City Department of Education, and SAP to create this model of a six-year experience. I'm never sure what, quite what to call it because students take their high school courses, but they also take college courses taught by our faculty, obviously our own courses. And the inaugural BTEC class will graduate, well, will complete. Again, I have to be careful of technical terms. They will have a completion for their four years in BTEC, and they're going to have that ceremony on our campus, because of course this is their second home. It's very exciting. Many of you met them uh, when, when their initial student government, they were adorable, they were student council leaders, and they were 12 and 13 year old children, well, young people, uh, and they came to our academic senate and I, I have to say, I've never forgotten it, and uh, I've kept in touch with a couple of them all along this journey, so I'm very excited about seeing them full-time on our campus very soon. The enrollments have been interesting, and the trends in, in what really um, has grown in terms of curricula. Historically, I mean, clearly we're a transfer institution, and historically liberal arts has, has really been the largest group uh, remains the most um, enrolled program. Uh, business transfer is, again, uh, pretty consistently our second, remains so. What's interesting, of course, is the growth of uh, criminal justice, which is our third largest, and incredibly, health sciences, which has shot through the roof in terms of enrollment. Uh, I, some of the enrollment trends include uh, our program. We, might, we just launched one in uh, Computer, computer science and information security. This, this was a dual joint degree program with John Jay. It started in the fall, and it now has 128 students, so as of last night, enrolled. That's an extraordinary acceleration. So the programs that have experienced these kinds of growths, we are committed and have allocated faculty positions. Uh, you know that I'm a tremendous fan of full-time faculty, as much as I love the adjuncts as well. They contribute greatly. But full-time faculty has certainly been a hallmark of Queensboro. Full-time faculty are here to support our faculty in and outside of the classroom. And they make us who we are, which is really a student-centered learning environment. So we begin this term with 408 teaching faculty and 48 CLTs. As you heard Dr. Lynch say, we have searches for several dozen. Uh, a number are in place uh, for the spring term. Four have already been hired for the fall term, and I expect that we'll see uh, the rest of several dozen new, new colleagues join us uh, by the next fall semester. This means a great deal of work for the academic departments, their PMBs, and members of their search committees. And I thank each and every one of you who have served. As, as Dr. Lynch said, uh, 15 academic departments have had searches going on. It is not easy. And the English department, I think we have to give them breakfast, lunch, and dinner for three days to get through their applications. Because again, there, how many do you have? Three, 300? There, that's a lot of applications to read. but. Clearly, people want to be here, which is nice. They want to teach at Queensboro, and we're so very happy to have the best that we get. Uh, a number of faculty have retired as of this term, and you might want to uh, wish them well, privately or publicly. Marjorie Deutsch from business, Ellen Feldman from dance, Richard Porato from social sciences, Arlene Potus from business, Hugh Rance from biological sciences and geology, and Rosa Rusinick from department excuse me, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. We wish them well, and uh, I think they'd be very proud of the new folks who will be joining us. I could go on about faculty accomplishments till probably the welcome back in the fall, but I won't. I'm going to say, because you, you're going to hear from three of our great faculty later on in this program. I do want to mention a couple of, of accomplishments of our students, because we just received word of it. These students were clearly inspired uh, and mentored by incredibly dedicated faculty. And we received word last week four QCC student research teams swept awards in the NSF Innovation Challenge Research Project Competition. 
QCC teams comprised four of the 14 in the CUNY finals, and our students were awarded the highest uh, prize amounts offered, which is wonderful. Three of the four QCC teams are moving on to the National Competition for Research Grants funded through the NSF i STEM Sites Program. I'd like to congratulate the students for their innovative research projects and their QCC professors, and especially Professor Christine Mooney. Christine, are you here? She's probably still working. She prepares them. She's their coach to prepare them for these competitions. And uh, we've had great success, but again, it begins here at home with faculty working with our students. I'm just going to read their projects, and I had to write them because I'll never say the titles properly. Some of you may have had these students in your classes. Uh, McHenny Pierre, who uh, graduated in January in biotech and is uh, at Stony Brook now, and his teammate, Mateo uh, Saez, who's a sophomore in biotech. They designed and produced a biotechnology sensing drone system using 3D printing with biotech sensors and cloud connectivity with artificial intelligence that can assist public safety responders detect gunfire and reduce crime response time. That's amazing, they really are. Mergon Pierre, who is still here, he's a sophomore in engineering technology who designed a heat sensing water reduction device with cloud-based operational capabilities which can be utilized in residential and commercial applications. His prototype valve was developed in our 3D printing and engineering labs. And his device can also be applied in medical settings to prevent the spread of germs, we could have used it this season, and in sustainability efforts in areas of extreme drought. He also received a recommendation from the reviewers to visit the MIT Water Lab in Boston for more discussions about his research. John Soteros, a fall 17 freshman in ET, designed an electronic tracking bracelet that allows caregivers to track a high-risk individual's location in real time with the use of a cloud-based mobile application for emergency notifications and an audible location alarm. A prototype is being built as we speak in our engineering lab with Jerry Sitbun, and John's research can assist uh, with special needs students. You've heard many times that they are, uh, they can wander away from their school, et cetera, and also it has use in um, community homes where patients with dementia uh, also can use this as a safety monitor. And finally, Kevin Almeida, a fall 17 freshman studying liberal arts, yay liberal arts, whose innovation challenge research project on healthy living produced software application that provides information for users on the nutritional value of foods and vitamins, allowing an individual based on their health, age, and weight to determine their dietary intake needs. It's pretty incredible. These young folks, who work with faculty and are so inspired, uh, they, and they inspire us, clearly. Now, not every piece of news is heartening, as much as, as these were. Two weeks ago, New York State um, reduced the CUNY operating budget for community colleges by $7 million. We call that sweeping our money. At Queensboro, that meant they took $1.15 million from our operating budget in mid-year. That's, um, a, that's a pretty heavy hit in mid-year because we've made commitments, um, obviously, at this point in time. Now, as you know, our allocation is based on enrollment. CUNY uh, community colleges seem to be okay, except New York State community colleges are not, which is why Albany swept the money, anticipating a reduction across those areas. Now, the impact of this hit on our budget hopefully will be mitigated by strong enrollment this semester. So please encourage, uh, if, you, if you've got a continuing student or a student from last semester who's not here yet, try to encourage them to come back if they're in good standing, et cetera, and, and finish up. Uh, because of a very careful budget monitoring, very careful planning, we have um, really done well to mitigate these changes, we will continue to fund our strategic priorities as we developed as a community. That certainly includes funding faculty lines, and it includes supporting strong and service uh, programs for students. So we're going to continue to do that. 
To sustain our effort, obviously, I ask everybody to please become involved in educating our legislators and our community about your departments, about your programs, and about the college itself. So many of us will be formally lobbying with New York State and New York City officials for a strong budget for next year. The governor's budget, as he announced it, appears to be flat right now for higher ed. Uh, he did reduce the base aid for community colleges. That's unfortunate. Uh, we will obviously lobby to get that restored. We usually ask for an increase because the current base aid for community colleges in New York State is still below 1990 levels. So we work very hard at that. Um, what is most persuasive with our public supporters and our donors, obviously, the incredible quality of our programs, our faculty, and our students. So uh, we will work very, very hard. I also want to mention there is no tuition increase for CUNY community colleges next year. We haven't had one this year. We don't plan one next year. That's all the more reason why students should stay here and complete a degree, because the gap between what tuition is at a community college and even a senior college in CUNY is growing. It is better to complete your program here with graduation. We've known from so many of you who work with other colleges, senior colleges, that our students are, have a great advantage when they graduate with a degree. So please do that. Um, there are always going to be challenges. But all of us uh, must stay focused on our shared goals and continue our constructive efforts to improve and excel. And we're going to do that as a community with all advice and assistance welcomed and valued. So I appreciate everything that you do every day. And I hope that you have an enormously successful semester. And I can't wait to hear the rest of our program because I'm anxious to hear from our three faculty who will tell you a little bit about what they're doing in their research. So thank you very much. Again, Dr. Lynch. Thank you, Dr. Call. <clears throat> As I mentioned briefly in my opening remarks, this is an important year for Queensboro as we approach our uh, Middle State site visit next year. Uh, several members of uh, the, the Office of Academic Affairs and Academic Departments attended a Middle States meeting in Philadelphia just before the holidays or in December. Uh, so Dean Corradetti and Dr. Uh, Professor Ford are going to update us on some campus initiatives. Uh, speaking as someone who has served as a Middle States re reviewer, I I've done site visits. I'm doing another one uh, in, in March, uh, Suffolk Community College. Uh, I know several of us in the room have done the same. Ben Morolo is currently serving on a, a review team for Suffolk Community College. Uh, we've been working closely with uh, Dr. Corradetti. This is not an easy lift. There is a lot of work that goes into preparing for a site visit, meeting the expectations and requirements of an accrediting body. So I'd like to uh, you know, publicly thank Dean Corradetti and his team for the work that they've taken in spearheading this initiative. But rather than hear from me about what Artie's doing, why don't I just let uh, Dr. Corradetti and, and Professor Ford tell us for, for themselves. Good morning. My name is Arthur Corradetti. I'm the Dean for Institutional Effectiveness in the, in the Office of Academic Affairs, and I am also one of the executive co-chairs for the self-study, and I'm joined by Professor Kelly Ford from the Business Department, who is also an executive co-chair. The third executive co-chair, um, Dr. Uh, Antonella Ansani, is out of the country at the moment, and we look forward to having her back shortly to uh, resume work. We wanted to take this opportunity this morning to give you an update on where we are with, with Middle States to this point. I brought up the website uh, because I'd like to show you 
a number of things, including the very lengthy array of colleagues from across campus who are working on this project. There are seven working groups, one devoted to each standard, and we have over a hundred faculty and staff members from across campus who have either volunteered to serve on a working group or, or who have consented to serve as a co-chair of a working group. And we're very grateful that we've had such an overwhelming response to the call for working on what is, as the vice president had said, an extremely important uh, project that we're engaged in for, uh, uh, have been engaged in and will be engaged in for the next year or more. Before we kind of get into the, 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 an, an update on where we are specifically, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Kelly to give you kind of an overview about Middle States, just to give you a sense of background and context what Middle States is about. Thank you. I'm honored to be able to speak to you today about the Middle States Self-Study Project. As many of you know, the Middle States Commission on Higher Education Self-Study Report is the process by which Queensborough gains reaccreditation. Previously, the evaluation process was conducted every 10 years. This was recently changed, and we now go through the accreditation process every eight years. There are two purposes. First is to advance institutional self-understanding and self-improvement. And the second purpose is for Queensborough to demonstrate to the Commission's standards for accreditation and requirements for affiliation right, that they meet these standards to external audiences, including Middle States Commission, governmental regulatory agencies, and the public at large. There are seven standards for accreditation and 15 requirements for affiliation. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through each one of them right now, but they are all available on Queensboro's site. Uh, one point I would like to stress is the, the biggest misconception is that the commission imposes these standards on us when in fact we demonstrate how we meet our own standards to them. We have a mission, we have a strategic plan, we have bylaws that we created, and on a daily basis uphold policies and procedures that we have set for ourselves. The commission will never ask, why do you have this mission? They will ask, how do you achieve your mission? Last spring, we established a separate, as Dr. Corradetti said, last spring we established a separate working group for each of the seven standards. Each working group consists of two co-chairs and several members. And again, we were very pleased in total to have over 90, uh, 100 volunteers. And we truly appreciate and thank every member very much for all of the hard work that you have already done and for your continued support and efforts going forward. In the fall of 17, each working group did research and submitted documentation to provide evidence of meeting their standard. Right. The, these documents the commission refers to as the documentation roadmap. Right. Ultimately, each working group will submit a chapter that will guide the final report to be submitted to middle states. They did an outstanding job last semester creating outlines, which will narrow our focus going forward. So as you can see, each working group's efforts and their talent 
drive the accreditation process. Right? And their dedication to this task should certainly be applauded. It is a collaborative effort, right? and input from all faculty and the administration is crucial, crucial to a successful outcome. I'm privileged to serve the college in this capacity and to be able to work with and learn from Dr. Arthur Cardetti and his extensive knowledge and experience in the area of accreditation. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Corradetti. As Professor Ford said, uh, a central focus of the self-study, and it's been reiterated again and again in every forum that I've attended, it certainly was a major theme at the annual conference, is that the self-study is mission central. Everything goes back to the mission. And that includes, as uh, Professor Ford said, the strategic plan, individual plans for the departments, our curriculum, everything is tied back to our mission, which defines who we are as an institution, what our goals are, what our values are. And the self-study is meant to focus specifically on that. The way it's organized, however, is through two institutional priorities, two themes that kind of shape the self-study. The self-study design that you see on the website is the document that the college needed to produce and submit to middle states for approval that in indicated how we were going to carry out this project. And one of the things that we needed to indicate in that document was how we were going to organize thematically our self-study. And the two themes that we've chosen are faculty and staff development and the Queensborough Academies. The self-study is organized around those two themes. Each working group will write about those two themes in terms of the standard they've been assigned. This is a departure from previous self-studies. Previous self-studies asked us to look at all the standards, all the criteria, and demonstrate comprehensive compliance with every criterion in each chapter. That is no longer the case. Now we have what's called, as Professor Ford indicated, a documentation roadmap, which is essentially by criterion, by standard, the kinds of documentation and evidence on campus demonstrating compliance, overall compliance. The self-study, however, is meant to show how we as an institution are meeting the standards in terms of the two themes that we're going to talk about in the self-study, faculty and staff development and Queensborough Academies. And these are two areas that were chosen because, in fact, they have been and continue to be central components of our strategic plan, and they're specifically cited in our mission and mission goals. So the self-study has tapped into major areas that we've concentrated on as an institution for a number of years and that is the way in which we're going to organize our, our report. To this point, the working groups have produced an outline of their chapter. We've provided the executive co-chairs provided feedback. The next step is to uh, compose a draft of the self-study chapter by March. We'll be providing a specific date shortly. And a finished product by commencement. Following that, the executive co-chairs are going to pull together a full self-study report. What then becomes significant to us as an, as an institution is what happens in the fall. In the fall, a, com a comprehensive self-study document will be distributed to the campus for comment. We'll host a number of forums throughout the fall semester, smaller groups, larger groups, 
in which we in, will invite feedback and comments about the document that we've produced. That will be a very important process that will allow the larger campus community to understand what we've produced and to be able to provide comment and feedback and helpful suggestions, to look for inaccuracies, to make corrections, to make this the best possible document we can make. In the fall, next fall, we will also have a visit by the team, the site team chair. By that time, we will know who, our chair, who the chair of our site team will be, site visit team will be, and that person will visit campus. They'll have a copy of the draft report. They'll provide some comment and feedback, which we must, to which we must respond, in fact. And we will finalize arrangements for the site visit. Uh, this chair will want to see where, where their workroom will be on campus, where they'll be staying in a local hotel. This person will basically be checking to see that everything is uh, being well prepared for the visit. In February 2019, the self-study report will be due to Middle States, and the visit will probably be in March 2019. They will arrive on a Sunday. We'll have a brief reception for them on campus. They will be on the campus all day Monday, all day Tuesday. The campus will be, of course, uh, well apprised of developments and know that they're here, know that they're coming. You'll know their names. And we will do everything we can while they're here to help them to find what they need to find, to answer their questions, to make ourselves available. It'll be a team of probably around seven or eight. These are not Middle States employees. They are our colleagues from the Middle States region. They are faculty and administrators just like us from the region who have volunteered to do this work. And when they finish their work, they go back to their own campus and get back to work. Um, I always remember specifically uh, very, very well the last time around when I met with the person doing assessment on the team who met with me and had some issues about our assessment. We had a long conversation. And then at the next annual conference, I met that person there. And she said, how are you doing? Fine, we have a monitoring report. How are you doing? She says, oh, yes, we had a Middle States visit. and." We were cited for assessment, and we have a monitoring report. So we're all in it together. We all go through the same thing. No one is exempt. And these visitors who will be coming are our colleagues. And they're not here to, for a gotcha moment. They're here to help us to uh, make the best possible case that we are in compliance and to make useful suggestions and recommendations, if appropriate. Finally, in June 2019, the commission will meet and render a decision. And at that point, we hope to hear that we are fully accredited and there is no follow-up ever. No, no follow-up <laughs> necessary after that. And that the next time we will see them is eight years after that. Which, and there is no longer a periodic review report. Um, so it is a self-study every eight years. And every year, there's kind of a, uh, an institutional update that we provide. So it's a somewhat different process. But the hope is, is that though we're going to welcome the visitors with open arms, we really don't want to see them for another eight years. Does anyone have any questions about the self-study process? I would just like to conclude by saying that, in fact, next fall uh, and then going into the spring, it really does become a, a campus-wide effort. You've had you know, colleagues who have worked on a, on a document, but now it's really opened up to the institution. Everyone will have a chance for input. There'll be a lot of discussion. There'll be a lot of preparation. There'll be a lot of angst, but ultimately, We'll get, we'll get through the site visit, 
And the hope is, is that all will go well and we'll get a clean bill of health and fully accredited and we can move on. But unfortunately, everything that we do that we normally associate with, with uh, middle states, like planning an assessment and, and uh, attending to our mission and fulfilling our mission, those don't go away. That's who we are and what we do, and that will continue to be the case, and we will continue to support assessment, to plan, to think about ways in which we will fulfill our mission. And certainly one of the ways, as you heard earlier, is through the Academic Momentum Initiative, which has now become a part of our strategic planning and will, in fact, inform some of our work for the future. So if there are no questions, on behalf of Kelly and myself, thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> so the theme for today's convocation is grant opportunities for faculty, and I'm pleased to introduce our next group of presenters who are recipients of the inaugural Academic Promise Grants that were offered by our college uh, this academic year. Uh, this Queensborough Community College had a great deal of success in acquiring grants from the PSC CUNY last year. We led uh, CUNY in the number of submissions, almost 80, and we led CUNY in the number of recipients, uh, nearly 60. So that's almost three quarters, as I look at my math professor again, um, uh, a success rate. But we had uh, received information from CUNY that they would have liked to have funded even more of our recipients, uh, of our applicants, because of the quality of their submissions. I shared this information with Dr. Call and asked if that might be an opportunity to sponsor some internal grants to recognize the strength of the applicants and to offer some incentives to further um, uh, encourage uh, applications in the future, and Dr. Uh, Call agreed to this and funded the inaugural group of what we call Academic Promise Grant uh, from the Office of Academic Affairs. And we funded fully four faculty members who had submitted uh, applications that were um, uh, considered by the PSC CUNY. Uh, the individuals were selected by a committee made of myself, Dean Palmer, and uh, the chair of chairs. Uh, after some deliberations, we recommended the following to Dr. Call. It was Dr. Wendy Ford from the Department of Business, Professor Kebedech Techlieb from the Department of Art and Design, Professor Leslie Ward from the Library, and Dr. Mangala Taudi from the Department of Biological Sciences and Geology. And they've been working hard on their projects. And this morning, we're pleased to hear of their progress from three of them. So at this time, I'd like to turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Wendy Ford and Professors Kebedich Techlieb and Leslie Ward, when they can re report on their progress as the inaugural group of recipients for Queensborough's Academic Promise Grants. Thank you. Good morning. Um, one of the terms that I've heard as you know I've been sitting here is momentum right so I'm gonna try to keep this momentum going it seems like we've had enough momentum to get ourselves almost back on track with our agenda so hopefully I won't uh, get us off track there um, uh, thank you Dean Lynch and I'd like to also thank the um, Office of Academic Affairs for providing this opportunity for me to do research funded research here at Queensboro. Um, the name of my study is listed there. I'm Wendy Ford and I'm a professor in the business department. Um, down. Okay, so I have been fortunate to have the opportunity to work with the BTEC team here at QCC. And um, Dr. Call already gave a little overview of BTEC at Queensboro. 
students at BTEC begin taking our college classes in 10th grade. Much of the work that I have, been done, I have done has been related to working with BTEC teachers, so these are teachers at the high school, and our QCC faculty to help ensure that the students who are taking our college classes are ready for um, or are ready or prepared to take our college classes. So let's meet two fictitious students. And these are not fictitious students that are only from BTEC. They could be from any high school. So we meet Pat. Um, struggles through early college courses, little instructor or peer interaction, not engaged and does not ask for help and barely passes. Now let's meet Riley. Anticipates challenges in early college courses, seeks help and in faculty interaction, is motivated, learns how to succeed, and learns how to pass. And some of you may have recognized or have students similar to Pat and Riley in some of your courses or in some of your interactions um, with students. So we could probably identify some reasons based on the information provided for their different college outcomes. And one of those factors is college readiness. Let's look at some data. There's a lot that can be said about this data, and some of us have firsthand experience in dealing with the reality that these statistics present. So what is college readiness? That depends on who you talk to, and it also depends on the context. So for um, my study, and this is, a, this is a definition of college readiness um, based on David Conley. And David Conley is a researcher at the Center for Educational Policy and Research in Oregon. And he has come up with this, this definition of college readiness. College and career readiness defined as success in credit-bearing gen ed courses or a two-year certificate program. So for my research, I um, used David Conley's work as a guide, and he has developed these four areas of college readiness. How do you think? What do you know? How do you act? And how do you go? Now there's a lot going on here because you can see that there are sub areas related to all of this. So obviously I didn't have time to go through all of that in my research. So I looked at two, I wanna say like two and a half areas. Um, and the two that I looked at were how do you think, which are related to um, cognitive strategies, and some of those strategies are listed there, and also how do you act, which are related to learning skills and techniques. And I just wanna go back to one of the slides here. This one here, there's also an area called what do you know? Now what do you know specifically relates to content knowledge, which is you know for individual particular courses, so that's the half piece or the little piece I'll talk about a little later. So my research questions that I looked at, um, listed here, how do high school students perceive their cognitive ready readiness for college? And that relates to this how do you think area and the cognitive strategies that are listed there. How do high school students perceive their learning skill readiness? And we have that information from the previous slide. And then also, how do these perceptions compare to um, students who are entering colleges after four years of high school as opposed to students who are taking, or not as opposed to, but in relation to, students who are taking college courses um, starting in 10th grade. So the real question, or one of the overall ways to think of this is, what are Pat and Riley thinking as they take their first college classes? So there's this aspect of related to what do they know coming out of high school, and then also what are they thinking about their college experience? So this spring, I will conduct a survey of our BTEC students, 
and these are their 10th grade students, which will be taking their first college courses in the spring. I will also include some of our College Now students as they take classes while they are still, they take college courses while they are still in high school. Um, using this beginning college survey of student engagement. And this is an instrument that was developed by Indiana, uh, University of Indiana. And this survey is administered to colleges through all, throughout the United States. And um, it's administered to entering freshmen. So now we can set up that comparison between those students who are taking college courses uh, while still in high school, as well as those students who are taking their first college courses as typical traditional freshmen. This will help provide a context. Um, in addition to uh, course grade outcomes, because we also look at how students are performing in those courses based on their grades, but we do want to be able to provide effective support for our BTEC students, but not just the BTEC students, but all of our students. So um, doing this comparison gives us a context for helping our BTEC students as well as uh, our traditional students here. Okay, this study also includes a faculty component. And as I said before, there was that area of content knowledge um, one of the things that I've been doing with BTEC is working with, as I said, high school teachers and our BTEC faculty, um, excuse me, our QCC faculty. And with the QTC, with the QCC faculty, I've developed a, what we call a college high school partnership communication model, or our ISR model, um, that we are using to guide students toward college readiness. And this also includes a content component in addition to um, the cognitive skills and the learning skills that we've talked about. And many QCC faculty have been vital in using this model. So this semester I'll also more formally survey and interview QCC faculty about the usability of this model as well as um, getting information about its effectiveness so that we can make that model, we can make improvements on that model. So college readiness is a complex to topic, as well as early college, edu um, early college education is also a complex topic. So my, with my uh, research, I hope to add to the ongoing meaningful work that we're doing here at Queensboro to help all of our students succeed. Um, the data collection, as I said, will begin in the spring. So what I've been doing, so you know, the question comes up as my husband keeps asking me, what are you doing? What is this thing you're working on? Um, uh, um, does modifying the study or aligning the, the BC SSE study to be more aligned to our student population, removing some questions um, that don't apply to us in terms of um, did students look at other colleges that they were going to go to and things like that. Um, and also going through um, QCC IRB as well as the DOE IRB and getting approval from high schools, which is all, you know, there's another study in and of itself just related to getting to the point where you can ask high, high school students questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, good morning. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. And I would like to thank Dr. Cole and the Office of Academic Affairs, specifically Dr. Palmer, for your great support while I was in Uganda and uh, before that as well. Uh, the title of my you know, project is Capsized, and it has two phases, Capsized 1 and uh, 2. Uh, it deals with the uh, current humanitarian crisis around the world, and specifically the focus is going to be on the Mediterranean, uh, coastlands and uh, the Mediterranean itself. And um, you're very familiar with the uh, crisis. Uh, people, uh, displaced people from uh, different parts of the world try to make it to Europe, take that route. And so many of them unfortunately die um, uh, because of so many uh, factors. And most of those people uh, actually uh, come from Africa. Um, because of that, I wanted to go to Uganda 
and understand what the situation over there is going to be. And why Uganda? Um, African countries like Uganda uh, are trying to open their homes for uh, displaced people from the region. And specifically, Uganda is um, getting a great deal of attention these days because of uh, its uh, uh, refugee settlement program, which is self-reliant. Uh, however, uh, there are so many problems uh, in those camps, and we, the question that we always ask, why do people take risk all the way to the Mediterranean Sea from Europe while there are refugee settlements in Africa? So I visited two uh, different camps. The first one is called Nakivali, uh, which houses uh, uh, several uh, refugees from different parts of Africa, specifically sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And uh, the total number of people uh, who are currently living uh, in that camp or settlement program is uh, over 60,000, uh, 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 over 60,000. And I also went to uh, another place called BDBD, which is um, one of the uh, biggest uh, refugee uh, camps in the world, and it houses uh, more than 270,000 um, South uh, Sudanese uh, refugees. There are distinctively different uh, topographies uh, between the two settlement programs, uh, places, including uh, the climate. This is Naki Valley. Uh, by the way, Uganda is very fertile, but uh, unseasonably, the area that uh, the settlement uh, uh, is located in Naki Valley was completely dry when I went to uh, Uganda uh, in July. So these are some of the uh, pictures. Then I interviewed uh, people, uh, more than 23, uh, people in the camp, uh, just to brief you on the situation. It was uh, very bureaucratic and very difficult to get to the camp. And once uh, I got there, I didn't get a chance to select uh, the people that I would like to interview, or I didn't get a chance to go to the settlement villages themselves. But the office of the OPM uh, selected few people for me, and I went with that. So I did my research before uh, what the conditions were. Unfortunately, I could not uh, verify some of the issues that I wanted to deal with uh, directly uh, in the interview. But through the individual answers they gave me, I realized that most of the things that I would like to know, uh, life in the camp, their uh, ambitions, uh, why they left their country, um, and so on, were actually embedded in the individual uh, answers that they gave me. So um, as you can also see it, uh, the people that were selected to me were, relatively speaking, um, stronger, younger, uh, etc. So that means I didn't get a chance uh, to see the lives of the children, the elderly, the disabled people, uh, etc. So this, uh, most of the images, the previous images, were from Naki Valley, um, BDBD, and this is Naki Valley. Naki Valley is the oldest uh, camp, and I found people uh, that lived for uh, 24 years, and five years, nine years, 12 years, etc. Uh, this is really a very devastating uh, situation, and that might answer why African refugees uh, try to go Europe to Europe instead, instead of uh, staying in the continent. Uh, you can see it in their uh, uh, images and uh, devastating uh, situations as they have been to. So distinctively, I was able to see uh, different attitudes and different emotional situation between the camp uh, in BDBD and also in Naki Valley. So uh, what do I do with all this information uh, is the question. And I proposed to do several things. Uh, number one, uh, I am an artist and uh, to create uh, artworks influenced by 
my research. And uh, number two, I uh, put together, I'm trying to put together the bigger one, uh, a video um, that documented you know, the real story, uh, first-hand information. Uh, and also, I wrote some, a few poems uh, in my own language, in Amharic. Uh, I, I don't write uh, poems in English. So some of them are being uh, translated. So these are some of the uh, installations, uh, studies that I did, and uh, the final works that uh, I exhibited. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, to be invited to exhibit or uh, to be included in one of the uh, international group shows uh, here in the United States at Maritime Museum in Savannah, Georgia. And um, I produced a uh, uh, few works uh, for that. Uh, information like this uh, really impacted uh, my thinking while uh, I was creating uh, the artworks. Uh, so many devastating situations around, and uh, uh, these are uh, powerful images that uh, really dominated again the way I felt towards the uh, uh, whole crisis. So the series of the artworks that I created uh, were called Non Buoyant Life Vest. Uh, and this is a statement that um, I put on the catalog. And uh, one of the installation uh, is this one, uh, Non Buoyant Life Vest, uh, series number one. Uh, it's a big uh, adjustable um, uh, installation. And materially, I try to work with non traditional material. Philosophically, I would like to bridge the gap between painting and uh, sculpture. Um, and I try to uh, incorporate in a very subtle way the way uh, I reacted to situations around me. And this is uh, a big work, hard to get the whole nuance uh, through pictures. And um, the second piece, Nan Wendt, uh, Life Vest, another uh, installation. Uh, some details of uh, detail two and uh, detail two uh, again. So uh, the next part is going to be uh, a video uh, that I uh, rushed to put together, uh, basically. Okay. So hello, everybody. I'm Leslie Ward. I'm the Emerging Technologies Librarian here at QCC. Um, and the name of my project uh, is Took Tea at the Asylum, Biopower and Authority at the New York State Asylum for Insane Convicts, which uh, might sound confusing because I'm a librarian, um, but the librarians here at QCC are uh, tenure track faculty, which means we also have to have a subject specialty degree as well as a library degree, uh, and mine's in the history of medicine. Um, and so it was a nice opportunity to be able to do my history research uh, with this grant, um, because if it doesn't work out in the end, I can just use my alternative title, why were you in Albany? How to frighten your family and confuse strangers at parties. Um, because I don't know if you know this, but telling people that there's a legal difference between insane convicts and the criminally insane is a great icebreaker. Um, so you're probably going to wonder how I ended up here. Um, like I said, my uh, master's subject specialty is in the history of medicine. Uh, I wrote my master's thesis on a place called Broadmoor, Asylum for the Criminally Insane uh, in the UK. Uh, I wrote about uh, patient experience there. Um, and so when I came back to the United States, I thought I'd try to maybe compare, uh, compare experiences between uh, asylums for the criminally insane in the United States with uh, the UK. Uh, but it turns out there isn't anything really written on asylums uh, for the criminally insane here. Um, but in the reading that I did uh, discover, it was that the first uh, such asylum is uh, located in New York, or was located in New York. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so, and it actually predates uh, many of the asylums that are located uh, in uh, Europe uh, and the UK. And so I thought this would be a good place to sort of start uh, start with. Um, my interests are in a sort of overlapping between prison management and hospital management, and uh, this type of institution uh, sort of covers that. Um, so the basic goals of my project uh, were to basically survey the archival collections related to the asylum to understand and contextualize the role of the asylum. Um, the asylum is severely understudied. Like I said, the entire field in the United States is severely understudied. Um, it's 
archive is actually located uh, within the papers from Matawan State Prison, uh, so it doesn't have its own archive. Uh, the finding aid is uh, what's called box level, it's not item level, um, so they can tell me that they have boxes with these papers in them, but they can't tell me what's in the boxes. Um, and so needing, doing a survey was sort of uh, a necessary start. Um, then identifying the sort of key players, so who ran it, who oversaw it, um, and how was it founded, um, basically what legislation founded it, who, what architect designed it, where did the money come from, that kind of stuff. Um, and then finally identifying the key players and how it uh, operated in order to create a habitable environment. Um, so what I found so far uh, is that there are two sort of key players uh, at the institution. There's uh, the Board of Prison Inspectors and the Superintendent. Um, the prison inspectors are open to the public, um, but the superintendent's records are not. Um, even though the superintendent's records are not technically patient records, um, patient names, ages, dates, diagnoses, things like that are located within the superintendent's notes. And so as a result, they're considered patient records and they're protected by New York state law. Um, and so I have to go through a process, which I will describe. Um, and uh, however, the prison re inspector's records are open. So even though they list the name of the people that are being transferred from the prison to the asylum are in the prison records, I can use those records, no problem. <laughs> um, but I can't use uh, the superintendent's records. Um, but I will attempt uh, at first to establish the role of the prison inspectors uh, in the operation and management of uh, the institution, which was basically just money. They were the ones that said, how much money do you need? Here you go. Um, that's sort of where it started from. Um, but in the future, um, I am currently in the process of attempting to gain access to the superintendent's uh, papers. Um, so like I said, uh, patient records in uh, the state of New York are protected. Um, if these were federal records, so if it was, say, somebody from St. Elizabeth's Hospital, um, HIPAA would actually allow me to see them that uh, 50 years after the death of the patient uh, is when you can see uh, medical records. But New York State treats medical records as if the person is still alive. Um, which I don't know how that would be possible since I'm looking at records from 1858. Uh, the institution closed in 1892, um, but uh, I have to sort of jump through uh, what's called the Mental Hygiene Law, Section 3313. Um, I do not fall under one of the 12 categories that allows people to see medical records. I'm not uh, the patient. I'm not a family member of the patient. I am not the lawyer for the patient. Uh, so I have to become qualified as a qualified researcher. Um, that requires me to go through um, the state mental health uh, IRB program. So I'm, I've already gone through the CUNY one, but now I have to go through the state one. Um, and then I have to submit an IRB proposal to the uh, Department of Mental Health um, and hope that a bunch of doctors don't mind um, that I'm doing this research. Um, so there's that. Um, it's one of those things that I never thought in my life I would have to write on an IRB proposal. Um, there is no likely impact to patient privacy as they are likely deceased. Um, so that's uh, an interesting thing I've run across. Um, I'll then attempt to complete uh, a comparative study between the ideologies of both groups um, and examine how these ideologies were expressed uh, in the operation of the institution. Um, there is overlap in the 19th century between uh, prison management and hospital management in that uh, you were uh, being removed from the world uh, in order to repair yourself, either through rehabilitation, things like work, prayer, education. Um, but asylums encouraged uh, socialization and activity, um, whereas prisons uh, encouraged uh, penitence through uh, isolation. Um, New York is also famous in uh, prison history for having the first uh, um, group uh, that originally prisons were, uh, you were kept by yourself, but New York, uh, you were, still weren't allowed to talk to anybody, but you were at least allowed out. Um, so how does, how does this asylum uh, fit in? Uh, and then finally, the place that the institution holds uh, in history, prison history, medical history, um, and then uh, its unique place uh, as an institution, a unique institution uh, because it's the first in the United States, um, and it's probably the third in the world that I've only identified two uh, that existed before this one. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to do. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you all for your presentations. And again, Dr. Call, for your support of the inaugural group of Academic Promise Grants. At this time, I believe there are a trio of breakout sessions. 
uh, in some classrooms just upstairs, one on QCC grants, a second on federal and CUNY grant organizations, and a third on IRB and human subject clearance. I thank you all for your attendance and your attention, and I wish you well in the coming academic year. Thank you.